Bien, euh, bonjour, merci d'être venu ou revenu. Hello and welcome for being with us. Today, before I start this lecture, I'm going to try and tell you how it's going to be structured across the eight lectures. In the great tradition of the Collège de France, there will be a lecture and a seminar. There will be something more. In the afternoon, for those of you who are interested, we will have a work session because the, the tradition of the Collège de France is to teach science in the making, I thought it would be useful um, to uh, witness uh, what is being done by postdoc students. So this afternoon we will have an informal uh, meeting in room number four with some colleagues or postdoc uh, students who will make brief presentations about the subjects that were discussed in the morning. And then we will have a discussion on open, uh, based on open questions. So every Friday, we will have the lecture, the seminar, uh, time for lunch, and we shall resume from 2 to 5 p.m. with a series of presentations in room number four. Naturally, uh, in the great tradition of Collège de France, everything remains very open, and another interesting and important point is that the afternoon seminars are not fixed in advance. If there are people who want to come along and tell us what they, do, they, they are doing, of course, obviously, they cannot monopolize uh, the time, but the rule is that everything is very open. If people just want to come along and talk, um, all they need to do is make themselves known. So, the spirit of this uh, series of lectures, as I was saying, uh, from uh, materials encountered by chance to uh, structured materials. Uh, today we are going to be looking at uh, multifunctional architectured materials. And the manner in which we're going to proceed is that we're going to start with uh, multifunctional architectured materials. We're going to see the various requirements that exist to fill the gaps. And we shall finish with uh, bio-inspired materials, those which need to fulfill various functions. So, multifunctional uh, architecture materials. This is the rationale behind all of this. You have the space of the materials um, in terms of uh, properties. It is like a Swiss cheese with a lot of holes in it. And what we're looking for to fulfill a given function um, is very often a material that does not exist as such. So what we're going to try to do is to try and create this material. And traditionally, we would say, I want to optimize the molecular chain or I want to optimize the thermal processing of the alloy, uh, but that is not necessarily sufficient. And the idea behind architectured materials is to combine them with a given geometry. So this simple example here, which is a cable, which has both properties of uh, uh, mechanical support in order to reduce the number of uh, electrical posts and principles of electric, electric uh, principles of electric conductors. Um, if you take a good conductor, um, they're usually as uh, flexible as bubble gum, and you need to combine uh, several materials there. Here you have a blend of copper and steel. You'll say, if you put that in a slightly corrosive atmosphere, it's going to be uh, rather dangerous. But virtually, it's a very interesting material because it gives you the combination of elasticity and uh, resistivity, which places you here in this area where no uh, other material pre-existed. So in order to construct this virtual material, you have um, the essential ingredients. You've combined them. You've played on the geometry. You have fine-tuned the scale, but when you combine them, in order to say, to describe uh, this virtual material, you need to modelize it, uh, to model it. Uh, this is very trivial because you're taking wires that are parallel, and the mechanical resistance will be um, a weighted average of the mechanical mechanical resistance of all of these wires, and the same goes for its. Uh, uh, capacities as an electric conductor. Um, but this shows why um, modeling is essential in producing architecture materials. So what is the rationale behind all of this? 
The rationale of the course is to have a request, a functional analysis. Here in this particular case, we have an electric cable. We want longitudinal conductivity, radial insulation, um, a unsuppleness um, when flexed. No material fulfills all of these criteria together, and therefore you need to break them down. Good conductors will be metals. Unfortunately, they have a high module. Um, um, they have high flexural resistance unless they are sufficiently thin, therefore you play on uh, the geometry and have a cable rather than a bar, a rod. And once you've broken these requests down, you're going to look for optimized functions. This will not necessarily result in the optimum optimorum, but it helps to explore interesting solutions. So in terms of electrical conduction, and uh, bendability, uh, you use copper. For the longitudinal uh, conduction and uh, elastic bendability, you use a polymer, and that would be the cover of the electric cable, which I discussed in the inaugural lecture. Once you have done this, you need to recombine all of these elements, not merely um, have materials, but geometries. And you're also going to need to ask questions about engineering the interfaces. Um, for instance, the radial insulation of the polymer. There must be a good adherence between the polymer and the cable. Uh, in this particular case, it's not very difficult. It's more difficult for uh, a tire, uh, the elastomer, and the radial carcass. And that requires mobilization of the uh, uh, physics and chemistry of uh, um, um, of uh, this and how you can interweave them to have uh, proper adherence. So what we have made here is a hybrid multi-material solution. And this solution, naturally, um, we will need to say, uh, to ask and see whether it can be manufactured um, at an acceptable cost. So that is basically um, how we're going to be working. So what are the possible strategies to fill the holes in the space of materials? Uh, you must try to resolve contradictory requirements and either uh, tailor the microstructures and the materials or its architecture or the combination of different materials. So I shall essentially focus on architecture here. This diagram, you have seen in the first course, you saw this uh, diagram in the inaugural uh, lecture, metallurgy and the science of materi and material science in general um, looks at uh, microstructure, everything that's under the micrometer. Uh, the uh, architecture tried to work in the superstructure, what's in the red shape here, and we tried to explore what is in between, between a few microns, a few centimeters, either with gradients, graded micro-materials with variations of um, com on the scale of the components, or by combining materials and architectures to uh, fill, uh, fulfill the various functions. So, just to reposition uh, the overarching principle. So what we're going to try and do is see how the contradicts can be resolved, how the materials can be tailored with uh, controlled geometry, and then we shall see a few cases of how you have a more subtle multifunctional um, approach than it just needs to be flexible and uh, be an electrical conductor. And we can see how we can construct a hybrid material for a particular industrial application, which will lead me to my conclusions about the limitations and open questions. And that will end this morning's course. And then we shall have a seminar, a seminar by Olivier Boisiz, who will illustrate these concepts based on uh, materials that have been produced either in um, um, steelworks or from materials consumers. But a really very serious question about which architecture material must be produced, why and how, and uh, why is it interesting in that it fulfills the function I require. So, resolving contradictions. Let us examine a few 
iconic contradictions, structural uh, contradictions, first of all, not between functional uh, properties. A very simple contradiction is to ha find something that is both stiff and light. Why is that a contradiction in terms? Because if you want it to be rigid, stiff, what is important is the connections between atoms and the number of connections. If you want something rigid, stiff, you must have a lot of links and you must have a lot of atoms. So you have strong links which are covalent and you have uh, uh, metallic. Uh, connections and the problem with those of course if you have them you're going to have a metal which will not only be stiff but which will also be uh, reasonably ductile the problem is that metals are usually very heavy and as you want a high density of metals you're going to end up with something which in order to be rigid will need to be heavy so the answer to that in this particular answer in metallurgy, um, there's nothing much left to be done apart from make um, uh, composite materials. But uh, if you look at it from the mechanics point of view, you can just say that it's the shape of the part that will create its stiffness. Instead of making a, a square beam, you can make an I-shaped beam or girder. That's very obviously a well-known uh, application in construction. It's much more rigid for a very simple region. You have moved uh, the material away from the neutral fiber, and therefore you have much stronger rigidity. And you can do this with a I-shaped, O-shaped, or square-shaped beam. If you want to do it with panels, you can have uh, sandwich structures, sandwich panels, with um, uh, pretty much anything in between. So that would be the answer from the uh, mechanics point of view. Let's look at uh, something slightly more difficult. You want something that is both um, strong, which has a high limit of elasticity, um, that um, can withstand constraints, but it would need to be deformable, and the flaws would not propagate brutally. Um, to obtain critical uh, cracking. So here there's a contradiction, a very deep contradiction in terms of physics. What makes a crack propagate or not? It's the release of elastic energy. And you dissipate the energy in order to, uh, to limit uh, the propagation. What you do is that you, you're creating an additional surface that creates uh, costs energy, not so much. But if you deform uh, plastically, uh, if you deform the volume, that is very um, energy consuming, a factor of 10 to the power of 3 between uh, plastic dissipation and creation of a crack. So this places you in a situation where intrinsically, if you restrict the um, capacity to deform a material plastically, it's going to become fragile, brittle, which is not a good thing. This is a diagram, this is what I call the engineer's nightmare. Um, this particular one is for steel, it's the steel banana, but it's not the funny banana. You have elongation on the one hand, elasticity limit on the other hand, and if you take a Martin City uh, steels that have low elongation, or Yev steels, uh, which is uh, pure iron almost, you have materials that are very, very easy to deform, but which have uh, properties of mechanical resistance that are very low. And then you have this anti-correlation, of course. And in the development of new alloys, you're trying to um, defeat this. Um, various types of steels, of advanced steels, were developed in order to um, mitigate the contradiction. So one way of setting aside this contradiction is by using concepts that come from the higher scale. The first example of architectured materials here that I would like to tell you about is the example of self-blocking interlocked materials. Here at the top you have a certain number of cubes that are stacked in a way that each cube is prevented from moving upwards by its three neighbors or moving downwards by its three lower neighbors. So you have a geometry where you contain 
uh, something from the side, and when you try to solicit it through flexion, you're going to have rigidity that's essentially due to friction between the various blocks and the rigidity of the blocks themselves. And you can feel that that is probably going to depend on how you send them, or assemble them or keep them together. They need to be kept together from the sides. So that is one example of a interlocked uh, structure. You have a slightly more uh, complex one here in the middle. It's the equivalent of these uh, uh, interlocking bricks, pavement bricks that you have on your drives for your car. They do not. They cannot slip here. In fact, they do not slip by because of the shape to uh, prevent uh, a slippage on both sides. And this type of structure is imposed from without, of course. Then, of course. This requires testing, and obviously you don't want to test it with materials that are too difficult to use. Here, um, in the diagram below, you have tests that were made with ice. The, um, these interlocked materials were made in the same way as ice cubes for a glass of whiskey. You can make a lot, they're cheap, you place them one next to the other, and you see the difference between a monolithic plate um, of the same amount of water, of ice, a, an interlock structure fragmented into uh, these smaller building blocks, but uh, fragmented with a very low constraint on the sides or with a very high constraint on the sides. So you have a material which, in a sense, uh, you can try to adapt to your particular requirement. So you have a solicitation here. Obviously, if you have a powerful pre-constraint, it's going to be rigid and very supple if there is less of that pre-constraint. But there is a hysteresis loop that appears here, uh, meaning that you're actually dissipating energy because you have friction. So the trick here is that if you have friction that is too high, the blocks cannot move and therefore you won't dissipate any energy. If it's too low, the blocks are going to slip, but the friction is going to be very low, so there will be no dissipation of energy. So you, you can sense that energy dissipation has an optimum point, depending on the friction coefficient and strength you apply to the sides. So here you can see how complicated this, the problem is. There are a lot of free variables here the material itself, the geometry, the friction coefficients. And all of this needs to be used in a way um, that you can look at various combinations of uh, structural rigidity and its capacity to absorb vibration, for instance. So I was just showing you this idea to say that you are looking for something that's both rigid and solid and that is not too sensitive to propagation of cracks. Um, so there's a bit of a random strategy. You pre-fragmented that. So you have uh, fragments. If one fragment cracks, it will not propagate to the other blocks. So by pre-fragmenting it, you create higher tolerance to damage. If you have a smaller block, um, there is less a chance of cracks appearing, and even if they do, they will not propagate the rest of the plate, meaning that your material is much more damage tolerant. So, and then depending on the geometries, you can have a situation where you can remove blocks without losing the rigidity of the hull. All of this to show, so this is an example. Um, a slightly more respectable uh, material than ice cubes. It's um, it's a polymer. You can see the differences in behavior. You have the same amount of material either in a monolithic plate or in um, uh, in, a, in a layer of blocks. Uh, one can be deformed, whereas the monolithic plate breaks immediately. So. All sorts of geometries are possible. Some very fine mathematical work was carried out on the shape of elemental blocks that could uh, lead to interlocking uh, shapes. Um, one of the things that the mystics love is that all the fans of um, uh, all these platonician shapes can be uh, brought together. It's no longer 
the easier the geometry, uh, the simpler the geometry, the more difficult it is to stack them because these um, 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 bricks for your drive has complex shapes. They're easy to interlock, but um, more simple shapes are more complex to interlock, of course. And this has, um, also has uh, consequences in terms of the repairability of a structure. Um, if you, when you're manufacturing something, you also need to wonder how it can be repaired. Uh, obviously, interlocking parts are very difficult to remove and replace because they are precisely because they're interlocking. So you need to have techniques uh, to uh, mitigate that. So here you have a geometric arrangement. Um, you can uh, catch a bit of a headache by staring at this picture. Uh, it's a pile of tetrahedra. And uh, none can move because it's stuck, blocked by its neighboring blocks. Here you have osteomorphic blocks. You can see that there are all sorts of ways of making them. Here, uh, the simple shape, but you can have uh, corrugated shapes, serrated shapes. And uh, the question of an, the optimal shape of a surface is important to have the good friction coefficient. Uh, these are pretty much open questions. So you can also use uh, slightly more bent structures here. We've got a pretty structure here, which is made with tubes. You pinch the top and you pinch the bottom, and that results in an interlocking um, structure. If you try to pull up one tube, it is stuck by the others, and you can imagine that this uh, can be very interesting uh, for in terms of acoustic properties, because the gas that is going to pass through the tubes is going to dissipate the energy of the acoustic wave either by making the tubes vibrate or by creating difficulties in the flow of the fluid between the tubes. And that said, you say you can have, um, it's like having a butterfly collection of all these interlocking materials, but and that wouldn't be a simple thing. But as you have very relevant parameters that are involved, properties of materials, choice of materials, shape, uh, friction coefficient, uh, size, because of that, you need to have a tool to explore the potential of these various classes of materials. So we're going to try to develop a um, modeling tool to guide the development of materials and think about how they can be placed within structures. So the modeling strategy which we adopted to examine this problem was done in two cases. The first one was for cubic, cube-shaped blocks and osteomorphic blocks. What we have not done, and which remains an open, open question, is to determine whether this method can be reversed in order to find the optimum shapes. What I'm going to show you is a number of rules which seem to be quite robust with uh, two uh, different cases of um, piling um, in terms of the effects of friction coefficient or elasticity modules. Um, the way in which the modeling is done is either very brutally, you can say you have a finished elements calculation, mesh everything and see what that yields, or Say I want to be a little bit more subtle in my analysis, remove a couple of blocks from time to time. And here the idea is to have a two-step computation. The first one is to calculate interactions between blocks. That's a finite elements uh, simulation uh, in which you have a slippery interface. It's not ideal. You just do it with two blocks. And then you're going to say, based on the position of the blocks, um, the distance between the center of gravity and the positions of the trihedron um, representative of each block, you can see what the force of attraction between the blocks are, and these various forces can then be placed into a discrete element code, um, which is the macroscopic equivalent of uh, um, a dynamic molecular behavior, and you're going to see how a great number of blocks behave uh, when the laws of interactions have been calculated separately. So, voilà le, uh, bloc cubic. this is our cubic block, just to show you a little bit how it works. You can see here the central block with type 1 and type 2 blocks around it. You can see type 1 blocks um, prevent the central block from going down and number 2 uh, uh, stops it from going up.
If you look at the curve here, in terms of the depth of indentation, it passes through a maximum, it's a parabolic graph, and beyond a uh, indentation depth, there's a perforation of the system. The cube moves to the other side. Another interesting thing is that you can vary the friction coefficient, and you reach something that is actually quite intuitive, is that when you increase the friction coefficient, if you could have an infinite uh, friction, you would uh, reach the same point as the monolithic uh, form. Um, what you see here in the dotted line is the monolithic line, and the various curves here in the different colors are in uh, increasing uh, um, friction coefficients. And one thing that has still not been explained and should be explored after all, this is science in the making, is how the transition between this uh, curve that goes up and then down, or rather than just up, where does the critical friction coefficient appear? Where does the transition come from? And that's a question that has not yet been systematically explored, because obviously that was not a priority. But I think it deserves to be explored. Further, so look, let's look at the influence of pre-stress or pre-constraint to compare that with experimental results. Here, our example, this was in Charles Brugger's thesis. These are examples uh, with cubes that were uh, made of a uh, material because, in fact, the tests um, on ice need to be done in a lab that is frozen at minus 30. So a lot of postdoc students feel a bit chilly after a while. So let's find something cheap, but not as cold. Um, and we chose plaster. It's actually quite use, uh, easy to make shapes out of plaster. So I wanted to see whether there was a change in the um, stiffness of the structure. What I want to show here is that you have a graph here uh, the um, equivalent more or less to the parable we saw goes up and then down and the more the pre-stress is high um, the more it goes to the left these are the results experimental results on the left and you can see that you, when you have a discharge here you have a material that can absorb vibration uh, thanks to the friction if you look towards the right here I did a, a little bit of a perverse graph here We'll look at it later. Here I wanted to see whether there was an influence of the uh, block size. We take the same hole, but with made up of smaller blocks. Obviously that creates more possibilities for the blocks to slide, so it gives a naturally more flexible structure. That can be proven by simulation, fortunately. If you look at the discharge of the system, you can see um, there's quite an amusing phenomenon there, because here you have the indentation uh, based on the depth of indentation, and you have a discharge. And after a while, um, a discharge occurs, creating a friction coefficient, a discharge coefficient that um, is equivalent to a negative, and which you can also find when you uh, simulate it digitally. And that's something that is the result of a plane, plane to a plane side contact. Uh, what I wanted to show is that if you, if you have your discrete elements uh, calculation for a certain number of friction coefficients or sizes, or modules, if you normalize the force, the maximum force, and if you normalize the indentation, perforation in the indentation depth, you, you always obtain a master curve, which in design is very interesting. Uh, this master curve here is the one in, is the dotted line here. The red one is the calculated one, and the blue one is the experimental one with plaster. So experimentally, you do have this master curve. The interesting thing is that with the infinite variety of materials uh, that you have, you have two parameters to characterize the behavior. One is the maximum 
um, curve indentation and maximum perforation. So if you want to have something to help you in the design, how does the maximum value of the parameter of perforation, how does this maximum um, value of force, how does that vary um, in terms of various parameters which I can access to design the materials? So there you have the effect of the friction coefficient, the pre-stress, the effect of size on maximum force and on uh, indentation perforation. So in a sense you have two parameters that you uh, where you're assessing the variability in the design parameters and that gives you um, tools to analyze your system. So I'll just finish this example of architectured materials by uh, telling you that uh, we thought we were particularly smart when we invented that, but noted notice that actually turtles had done it before us. Because when you look a turtle in the eye, it doesn't look particularly bright, but the shell of a, tur of a tortoise is interlocked. Of course, the big ones uh, have difficulties in breathing, so it needs to be slightly flexible, and when you want to make turtle soup, it needs to be rigid when you try and uh, knock it out. So what you do is that you have a shell that's made of hexagons with uh, uh, fingers, three-dimensional uh, fingers here, on the shape of the fingers between the hexagons, seen uh, observed by uh, uh, Peter Fratzel's team in Grenoble. And turtles are much smarter than us because what they do with this structure is that in addition to have an interlocking structure between the fingers, um, the dendrites in the shell, they have placed a polymer which has a capacity to deform. So when you slowly deform uh, the polymer, it's supple, but when you deform it brutally, it becomes rigid. So it can breathe because it breathes gently and when somebody knocks it to make turtle soup, they all uh, block each other because the polymer rigidifies. So that gives you a lot of ideas. Why wouldn't you make bimaterial interlock materials? Why wouldn't you replace some of the material by another material um, that would have dissipative functions? And these are currently, uh, that's currently under investigation. So let's take an extreme case. We have an architectured material that I would call uh, military in a sense, where everything needs to be perfectly well aligned in a straight line. All elements are perfectly identical. Um, but on the other extreme, you have the architectured material that's pretty random, with no systematic ordering. And that was a, a theory, a thesis made with Arcelor Metal, with Olivier Boisiz and Jean-Philippe Mas, uh, consisting in examining rock walls, um, steel walls rather, um, obtained quite brutally. You take an iron bar, um, an iron, uh, stainless steel bar, and you scratch it with uh, claws, and you obtain little shards of metal, you compact all of that, and it gives you your scarring pad or um, all the stuff with which you uh, polish your floorboards. Um, this material is actually quite interesting in the sense that here you have a degree of freedom um, are you going to let them slide one in relation to the other or not? You can feel how interesting that is. If they can all slip and move freely, it's going to absorb plenty of vibration. But if the fibers are stuck one to another, you're going to have a rigid material. And obviously, uh, you can decide to do this more or less. Uh, it's called it's called uh, sintering. We're going to try to have a thermal treatment. Easier said than done, unfortunately. I don't know if Olivier will tell you about that. But there's a thermal treatment where the number of beams that are soldered together will depend on the type of treatment, the fact whether you press your steel wall or not. So you can have contacts that are either totally free or totally welded. The result of this is that you can have deformation, stress uh, graphs here, where they reflect both density and deformation. You're pressing your sponge here, you're actually modifying the density of the material itself. You're bringing the fibers closer one to another. Um, one of the um, 
points where this is actually quite fun. Um, there are four or five papers that were published, including one, um, um, something I think it was about shearing sheep in Scotland, but it can be showed. This is Toll's, Toll's model. Um, you, you have essentially an elastic behavior of the uh, filaments of the threads, and rigidity is proportional to the natural constraint or natural stress, the uh, size of the uh, material, and varies um, so, um, to, with the power of density. So here you have what is called Toll's law, a semi-empirical law, and underneath you have a whole array with uh, a law of, of power here. And it varies depending on whether or not uh, you have rigidified the structure. Which brings me back to an intuitive situation, which is uh, the parallel uh, between these fibrous uh, materials, uh, intermingled fibrous materials, and the class of rigid foams. Look at rigid foams, open rigid foams, uh, essentially bars, which are perfectly soldered one to another, and which allows you to understand that you can model their behavior by considering that they're actually a set of uh, beams that are, have rigidity to flexion. It depends on the uh, material, that's what you call the laws of um, A.G. Gibson, which gives you, gives you a law of scale between uh, density of the constitutive material and rigidity of said material, and the elasticity, elasticity limit of the foam itself. So this places you in a slightly more subtle situation. You are compressing an intermingled material. You have uh, beams that are being flexed, but the distance between the point of contact is going to be changing as you compress it. So you can really feel that what you have here is a cellular material, but the size of the cells actually changes as you compress it. Obviously, this idea um, said otherwise can allow you to rationalize Toll's law. In order to rationalize Toll's law, you can see the number of contacts between fibers as you're compacting it. And I think here, um, in the Grenoble synchrotron, synchrotron experience, you use uh, X-ray tomography, the same <coughs> that's used in medical research. You do that in situ, on site. You compress that. So, I mean, it's actually not entirely trivial because you need to explore the material from every angle, and therefore you need to ensure that nothing screens the x-ray. So um, you have this little thing that's actually quite sim simple. It's uh, Columbus's egg. You have a polymer cylinder, and you use the polymer cylinder as a support for the compression machine. But Let's look at the way the way in which these microstructures can be connected. What we have just measured, the uh, number of contacts per volume, uh, and the mechanical property, which is stress for a given uh, density. If you look at a purely uh, geometric contact, you would probably expect, depending on the uh, 3D orientation, a 3D rounder or 2D orientation of the fibers, you can uh, consider that the coefficient would probably be between somewhere between three and five. Strangely enough, experimentally, that's not the result. But what you can be convinced of is that with this, with the rationale I, dis I evoked earlier, the number of contacts per volume units, you have the distance of the beam, the size of the beam, uh, to determine the rigidity of each beam. And once you have that, you essentially have what you need to uh, connect the uh, flow constraint as long as you know the number of contacts based on density, which is what you can see experimentally in uh, the, uh, experience, the experiment I just showed you. But this number of contacts varies like a power of density. It's not uh, the power that's created by pure geometric contact. And the reason is that this, um, I have no idea, but it is not what was uh, what is obtained in fully 3D or fully 2D idealized calculations. But there is a relationship between the N and the beta here. Um, this L uh, relationship is verified 
by experience. Uh, but where things start to hurt is that you have a description of the number of contacts based on density with a geometry that cannot be reduced to either a 2D or a 3D uh, dimension. So this is one instance. We saw two examples of architectured materials that were entirely regular and of entirely irregular architectured materials. And now I'll try to give you examples of architectured materials that are explicitly multifunctional. It's the exercise I was telling you initially. We're going to start with specifications, with a request. We're going to see how we can build, construct a material that does not exist yet. Three examples. First of which, one that was developed with Onera, how to develop an architectured material as a sound absorber. Second example would be how you can develop an architectured material for a radiant burner. And third one will be uh, to develop the uh, fuel tanks for the Ariane rocket. So what is there in the description? So noise reduction. Obviously, anyone who has lived near an airport knows that um, airplanes are noisy things. One way of uh, reducing the noise is to keep them nailed to the ground. But there's another way. You could always say, I've got these fantastic ideas. Uh, I can make a great material. After all, a noise is only a pressure wave. You just need to uh, send an opposing one, and you have a destructive, um, <clears throat> a destructive wave. It actually works very well in noise cancelling. Um, um, systems in headphones. Um, you have engines that work um, a thousand degrees when they're working, and uh, it would be you would if you try to oppose that, you'd be in a situation where having active noise cancelling is actually unrealistic. You could also say you need to keep. Uh, the noise in the jet. You can have sort of granite blocks around the jet, but then um, the aircraft won't uh, lift off the ground. So you need to have something into which the wave can penetrate and that dissipates the fluids, dissipates the energy. So you have the acoustic impedance of the material in which the wave is going to enter, and it needs to be similar to the acoustic impedance of the air. Uh, from which this wave is produced. So you need something porous and something with open porosity. So it needs to be made of something, so you need to pick your material. You're probably not going to take a polymer, obviously, because if you look at um, the temperatures at which they work, you could use ceramics. But you wouldn't want to sweep um, to sweep up the broken bits behind it. So you need to find something that's sufficiently ductile, but that can also uh, can work in high temperatures, resist oxidation, corrosion, creep, and that's probably going to lead you to try and find um, aerospace alloys, uh, nickel-based or certain steels, uh, stainless steels. Uh, if you want this uh, oxidation, um, prop if you want these oxidation properties. So you're going to find such or such uh, an interesting alloy. So we said that we wanted something either dense or porous, but we want something porous to dissipate um, the wave, the sound wave. We don't want, we want something that with open porosity to um, allow a sound to pass through or closed cell for better mechanical properties. Let me show you what was done here with the ideal material, which is a regular stacking of spheres. What you actually, uh, what is actually manufactured here, is an irregular uh, stack of spheres. And this irregular stacking of spheres, hollow spheres, to a little bit how hollow spheres are made. Actually, it's a very interesting question. Um, what one needs to do is to study the elastic, acoustic, uh, fatigue, uh, oxidation uh, resistance, and of course, acoustic properties of this given material. This is the ideal material. This is the actual material. And you have two beads here. 
Um, the manner in which they are connected, they are connected uh, by sintering, meaning that you have these two metal beads which are pressed one against the other at a temperature in which um, it could uh, diffuse, and that creates the mechanical uh, solidarity between the two. So we're good, therefore going to try to model acoustic and acoustics and mechanics to optimize materials geometry and dimensions and to, to determine the process. So let's look at acoustics. You can have a phenomenological model, model this is Bio Allard, uh, model in which you um, take uh, properties of uh, porous materials and you can calculate the acoustic properties in terms of sound absorption for a given frequency. That's a phenomenological approach which you can couple with a determinist approach, but only in a regular case. The determinist approach is using what is called homogenization techniques, which essentially mean um, solving the uh, Marlier-Stokes equation um, in order to see that, in fact, the modeling um, phenomenological modeling, which describes experimental observations well, um, is also uh, fundamentally uh, related to the geometry of the porous material of this uh, stack of beads. And what you can note is that acoustic properties are essentially a consequence of geometry in this particular instance. The absorption and dissipation is essentially uh, due to the gas which is uh, passing through a given geometry and the material itself um, is not important. Meaning that if you have hollow spheres and full spheres, nickel spheres or or steel spheres, you will obtain the same absorption. The absorption of your sound spectre is essentially uh, a fluid mechanics. It's not always the case, but in these particular spectrums, um, the materials under consideration, dissipation of the vibrations due to the structure itself, is negligible. Essentially, no plasticity. Alors. So, mechanics. Oh, we're going to try, obviously, to calculate Young's modulus, a finite calculation. Um, microplasticity, an elastic calculation to see where does the uh, material reach its elasticity limit, that it's being stressed beyond uh, irreversible deformation. And what I'm simply going to be doing here, because I can see that time flies, is to design something. Let us design something simple. Uh, let's first look at the objectives. The objectives are to m obtain maximum absorption for a given uh, sound spectrum. Therefore, you need ab absorption for a given frequency, precisely what I showed you before. And you need to factor in that with the distribution of the sound frequency to have uh, optimized absorption. You have to do that with minimum mass, minimum weight, because you also have to do that with a certain number of constraints um, in terms of strength and in terms of stiffness. And the variables you have here are, of course, the variables um, of the design of the layer around the motor, the engine. You have a kind of cylinder with a given thickness which is going to be made of spheres with a given radius. Each of these spheres has a given thickness. And you try to optimize all of these situations. So the degrees of uh, liberty you have is the uh, freedom is the alloy, microscopic geometry, macroscopic structure, modeling tools, acoustics, and mechanics based on geometry and the material that is used. So for a given sound spectrum, noise spectrum, um, it's I was saying that it was basically linked to the external structure of the porous material, the channels you have between the beads, and for a given thickness of absorbent and a given radius of each of the spheres, you have an area here where uh, you have optimal absorption. Um, if you have a, this is the spectrum where it's optimized. 
Um, and, and you can actually calculate the space in time, uh, thickness and size of sphere that optimizes uh, the absorption of a given sound wave. So mechanical absorption, you're going to examine stiffness and strength. And what you can show here is that the uh, parameters combining the pr properties that control uh, stiffness, uh, what you need to do is to optimize essentially um, a module uh, divided by density or certain power of the limit of elasticity divided by density. And you can see here what we have developed that says what the geometry should be based on the uh, chosen on the uh, chosen spectrum and what material must be chosen based on uh, given stiffness and strength. So, in selecting the material, you're going to be using the process um, I discussed in the inaugural lecture. You're going to pre-select um, based on uh, resistance to creep and oxidation and analyze that along these various criteria, module divided by density and limit of elasticity divided by density. So my conclusion about optimization, um, the acoustics are imposed by geometry, the choice of material, the choice of the thickness of the various hulls and the radius of the spheres. And the constraints, additional constraints, of course, are uh, temperature of operation, uh, environment, and, and that removes a certain number of materials. So then the question is, how do you actually make this stuff? Brings us, this brings us to the manufacturing process. One way of doing this would be to use polystyrene beads to chemically coat them with copper, then to electroplate them with nickel. And once you've done that, of course, there's still a polymer in there. So it's not really what you want because it needs to work at around a thousand degrees. So that's not very cool. So what you do is that before the nickel ceases to be entirely porous, you're going to grill that out. And um, when you grill the polymer, uh, it's going to turn into gas and then the hull's going to burst. And then you add another layer of porous nickel. So said like that, it's all very pretty, but obviously you're not going to take years to do that. There's another way of doing this. It's um, to do what bakers do and use um, truffing. You're actually going to rub them. You, you have a kind of a powder of an alloy. You can do it with a powder rather than nickel. And you, you're sort of rubbing these spheres in this super alloy with, with a binder. And then you sinter that. And you can make um, the materials I've just discussed. Obviously, this needs to work in high temperatures. So that said, what you need to do is to develop a surface treatment to cover the spheres, for instance, with uh, aluminium, aluminium, to give a protective antioxidant uh, layer against oxidization. So that is basically the process that brings you from specific specifications to materials construction. So what else, as they say in good coffee stores? Well, after all, this material, if you put this around an engine on an aircraft, um, it might end up um, with a bird stuffed in it. If you have a Canadian goose that enters a jet, it makes major damage. Um, up to the goose, naturally, but also to the engine. So if the goose enters the absorbent layer, that's not very good. So how can it deform greatly? Um, which leads me to show you another aspect of this issue. Is all of the calculations I've just showed you allow you to understand the elasticity and the limit of elasticity. But if you have a Canadian goose that enters in, that impacts that, it tests a little bit more than elasticity. Um, it actually smashes it. So you need to understand the high deformation behavior of such materials. And here the um, finite elements calculation, finished elements calculations are useless. You need to develop a 
phenomenology. A very simple one to qualify that. Here you have X-ray tomography image on stacks of stainless steel spheres. You're going to compress them with varying density, and you obtain that curve here. You see it's elastic, there's a kind of plateau, and then it starts again. Well, physics actually uh, quite simple because you're actually densifying that because obviously the material becomes denser after you compress it. So, how do things happen inside? You're going to have a sphere that's actually going to interpenetrate another sphere that's going to compress it until one of them bursts. So the result is pretty much this. You're actually compressing the spheres, and these spheres are actually flattening into pancakes. So you have a transition between a sphere and a pancake, and obviously that cannot be calculated. So you just need to measure the number of pancakes versus uh, the deformation, and you're going to have a phenomenological model to give you a number of spheres and number of pancakes, and you describe that as an association between healthy uh, material, damaged material, and compacted material, and that gives you a simple phenomenological um, but usable description of the behavior of the material, allowing you to say, this is the amount of energy I can absorb when I fully compress uh, my stack of spheres. But you can always try and have a little bit of fun um, and say, OK, what I've told you about interlocking elements, perhaps I could do it here with a, um, a dynamics here to um, for this random stacking of uh, spheres. This actually works quite well to describe a random stacking elasticity, but more difficult for its plasticity and the plasticity of this random array of spheres um, is one of the open questions. It's not quite by chance that these tools are used that come from granular materials. Um, you have an approach here which is more sort of um, based on mechanical tests, but these grains of two tests, they have the crushed and non-crushed states. So just to show you that um, these, I mean, they're quite solid materials. Um, you can see a sandwich panel. That's actually not a bird impact. It's a, it's actually a, a sort of cannonball impact. And at the top here was, can I shape this sandwich structure without destroying uh, the spheres inside? Oh, I've only got five minutes left for three examples. Oh dear. So I don't think I can do all three of them then. Oh, so the example of a radiant burner. You need to have a gas that passes through a, a porous material, uh, ceramics obviously, in view of the high temperatures or some alloys can be used. And what we're trying to achieve is that the flame is right in the middle of the porous uh, element so that you can have a radiative um, means of heating. So we have here the flow of fluids, flame dynamics, chemical reaction that's going to create the heat. And all of this needs to be done in a way that can be designed optimally to obtain maximum heat for a given amount of gas. And of course, what you're trying to achieve here is that this maximum amount of heat uh, can be maximized um, without producing too much CO2. So you want to save energy without leaving too much unpleasant stuff seeping out of this burn-up. So I won't go into the details of this case, but um, we, what we're uh, discussing here is uh, uh, fluid mechanics, heat uh, transported by transfer by the gas. We have radiative transfer, reaction rates based on temperature, chemical products. And of course, to, in order to do this, you need to have the permeability of the material based on its porous structure and its thermal properties. And what you do when you're doing this is to select materials and you can have selection maps in terms of materials. 
that show that based on the power you want to have in your burner and the um, amount of energy you want to release and the amount of toxics that you want to uh, avoid, you learn which materials to take. And um, materials with a particular geometry, a porous material with a cell size of around one millimeter and porosity of around 90%. Right, so I think I'll probably skip this one and go to the end. So what I was trying to show with these few examples, which are in fact going to be illustrated uh, later on in by Olivier Boisis in the seminar, we're going to be discussing a certain number of issues. Um, we're going to see how this type of uh, architectured materials uh, can be adapted in cases. I can see that Pierre Bolen is in the room. Um, how you can have uh, electro-mechanical uh, uh, protection, where you have something that's both mechanically solid, but also that can absorb electromagnetic radiation. And uh, I won't uh, tell you too much. We won't spoil this afternoon's pleasure, but we'll be working on geometry on the material and are actually manufacturing a material in addition to its geometry, a composite material. So there are a certain number of examples this afternoon that you will hear about where we are trying to have a construction of materials uh, based on specifications. What I really like to um, finish on this morning is that a certain number of fundamental questions remain. Um, I've discussed a few as we move forward, but there is one key issue, the uh, uh, structural mechanics. I said that we were looking at the uh, spread of materials comparable to um, that of its components. And what we like to do for this type of thing is to have a uh, mechanical description of continuous um, environments, how you can have a continuous description of behavior and uh, while integrated the uh, intrinsic scale of the system. So the interface um, between the constitutive materials is key and how do you optimize the interface. The collective behavior is also a major issue. Um, especially in entangled materials. And an applied mathematics um, aspect that's very interesting when you have more or less complex specifications. What's actually quite strange is that you're optimizing within a very strange uh, chosen space. You have discrete cho choices of the materials, continuous choices, which are geometries. How can you develop optimization tools that are both um, for discrete choices and continuous choices. Uh, people who work in optimization are very interesting, interested in this. Obviously, you need to have combined optimization tools. You can always say that you're going to be using such and such technique to see how to optimize various islets of this material space. And once you're in one of the islets, use optimizations of uh, uh, continuous type to explore where you are in such or such a space of the material. So currently we're actually in a situation where it's all done a little bit happy-go-lucky and we would like to have something more systematic to help us how to choose the optimization tool to find optimal accommodations of geometry, material and scale. So this is a list that you really should not be reading at all but which will be available um, on the website with other elements of the lecture. Uh, this is actually a case list, um, a list of examples with engineering targets and architected solutions. And this list, you shouldn't read it because it's a never-ending list. There are lots of cases that are emerging uh, as time passes. And you can see here where the solutions were either fully developed or at least explored. So initially I had a look at a few very simple examples of a conflict, of a obvious conflict between uh, 
stiffness and mass. But here the other examples are slightly more sophisticated, such as um, cutting tools for a quick machining. So you need to have both very good mechanical resistance and you need to evacuate heat very quickly, uh, heat from the friction. So the triangle of all this is that, of course, you need to combine microstructure and architecture. You mustn't forget everything that you've learned in, learned in material science. And you need to wonder whether you could perhaps not also optimize the microstructure of the architecture that you're making. But here you have questions that are not very easy, because if you want to optimize a, a metal microstructure, you must have a thermal uh, treatment. And this thermal treatment is thermal of course. Uh, you're going to need to couple it to the thermics of the architecture you're making, and that adds a level of complexity, but it gives you additional freedom. So, the take-home messages. Architectural materials that I've examined today expand the spectrum of possibilities. Uh, modeling is essential in this approach to materials design, that it's a natural way of bridging the gap between design and material, design as in um, um, product, product design, and there are a certain number of criteria that remain and challenges that remain totally open. What I have just said this morning, I've showed you examples of architectured materials, and you saw gradually how um, which type of tools we needed. One of the first one was the tool to choose the materials. And what I shall show you in the next lecture, how in a given space of materials, notwithstanding the fact that you want to do architecture materials or not, what are the systematic methods that we use to select materials based on given specifications within a structured space of materials? That will be the following lecture. And then gradually we're going to move back down the ladder uh, of scales, and you say, yeah, that's all very well, but what microstructure do I need to obtain these properties? And that's going to dive, bring us, make us dive deeper into the physics of transformation to see how one can design the transformation steps, how one can understand the relationship between microstructure um, and uh, processing and uh, microstructures. And we're going to explore a whole set of problems which are uh, classic, but from the point of view of their integration into materials design. Thank you very much for your attention. And that's brought me exactly on time. And uh, we're now going to take a short break, and then I shall yield the floor to Olivier Boisiz, who is a research engineer for ArcelorMittal in Metz and who holds the Areva chair at the Ecole des Mines in Paris on nuclear materials. Thank you for your attention.